Hi, everybody. Welcome to our March Free Press Book Club. My name is Erin Labar. I am your book club admin. Apologies for some like weird screen glare that's happening on my glasses tonight. Um, we'll do a quick round of intros. So of course, you know Ben Sigurdsson, our literary editor at the Free Press. Then we have John Tapes, who is our representation from McNally Robinson tonight. And of course, our author, Rowan McCandless. Thank you so much for being here. Um, before we continue, uh, I just want to make note that Ben, John, Rowan, and myself are all joining you from Winnipeg, which is Treaty 1 territory, the traditional land of the Anishinaabe Cree, Oji Cree, Dene, and Dakota peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. We will run tonight as we usually do. John will do an intro, we'll do the Q&A, and then we'll talk a little bit about ne next month's pick and next month's meeting as well. Uh, and if you have any questions or comments, you can throw them in the chat. I will be keeping an eye on that throughout the evening. and. Uh, if there's questions, we'll incorporate them into our discussion. And um, with that, I'll throw it to John to kick things off. Thank you so much, Erin. Um, I am the event coordinator at Valley Robinson. So as a result, we had the incredible pleasure of launching uh, this book into the world just last year. And one of the most pleasant things about this book club was being able to re-engage with it once again. So I'm so grateful for this opportunity. Uh, Persephone's children, a Life in Fragments is an innovative mix of personal essay and memoir. It was published by Rare Machines, an imprint of Dunder and Press. While a simple description of the book would be one that describes McCandless's work as the document of a biracial woman and writer escaping an abusive relationship, a description like that would be a little bit reductive given how boldly and confidently this work covers uh, so much ground. Through a series of linked, formally inventive and aesthetically bold vignettes, Rowan examines motherhood, trauma, intergenerational and uh, personal mental illness, and above all, personal strength and resiliency. And that's just lightly touching on the many themes uh, in the book. The essays take the form of a screenplay, a crossword puzzle, a workbook, a series of house rental advertisements and more. Though its title hints at the classical tradition, this is a resolutely modern and incredibly absorbing work. Uh, the imprint that it was published under, Rare Machines, has as its mission statement that a writer is a rare machine for producing books, and the book itself is as elegant and complex as the most unusual of devices, and that description certainly holds true for Persephone's children. Its author, Rowan McCandless, is an award-winning author of fiction and creative nonfiction, and serves as the creative nonfiction editor for The Fiddlehead. She has been long listed for the Journey Prize, won the Constant Rook uh, Creative Nonfiction Prize, and received gold for one of a kind storytelling at the National Magazine Awards. And now it's my great pleasure to turn things over to Rowan McCandless. Thank you so much, John, for that wonderful introduction. I'm so happy to be here with everyone tonight. Um, John, Ben, and Aaron, thank you just so much for this opportunity. I'm going to be reading two selections this evening. Um, the first is called Thoughts on Keeping a Notebook. And in, I made use of a notebook journal as the structure to kind of hold this piece. So this is from Thoughts on Keeping a Notebook. Keepers of private notebooks are a different breed altogether. Lonely and resistant rearrangers of things, anxious malcontents, Children afflicted apparently at birth with some presentiment of loss. Joan Didion on keeping a notebook. I didn't keep a diary as a girl. I never filled pages with childhood musings secured by a lock and a tiny brass key. I never possessed a, for my eyes only, keep out this means you, lock and take journal, plastered with butterfly, puppy, and heart-shaped stickers. During my adolescence, I wasn't one of those teenagers curled up in bed late at night, wearing flannel pajamas and my emotions on my sleeve, penning the pages of a secret diary kept hidden between a box spring and mattress. Given my parents' mantras, blood is thicker than water, and our family does not air our dirty business in public, even the thought of keeping a private diary felt like I would be betraying them. A dutiful daughter, I imprisoned my perceptions behind walls of solitary confinement and threw away the key. The wick darkens as my counselor Celine lights the candle, wax sputters. The candle's flame casts a warm glow of optimism between us. She places a box of tissues on the table in neutral territory before asking how my writing has been going. 
I hold back tears because I haven't written in months, haven't written because I can't concentrate well enough to write, haven't written because I can't stop thinking about what's happened, what's happening. I haven't written because part of me still believes that I will be breaking my ex's rule of secrecy. I may have left him, but I'm still not free. Lena just washed the tissues on the side table toward me and I fight the urge to pat, push it back. Have you thought any more about my suggestion about keeping a journal, Celine says. Maybe writing down your thoughts and feelings will help to open space for your other writing. I tell her that keeping a journal feels about as much fun as getting a root canal. It can help with the stress, the overwhelm from all the traumas. I tell her that I don't wanna sit with that much pain. Lean looks at me and says, but aren't you sitting with it already? And now I'll be doing a short reading from an essay entitled A Map of the World. And to um, hold that essay, what I used for the structure were geographical terms. And that's what was used to ground the book or ground the essay. A map of the world, orientation. I'm in the throes of a flashback, a step back, a remembrance of times past, a brief passage of time since I've left him. I speak with Tara from the crisis line who wants to know, are you safe? Yes. Where are you right now? Living room. Who reminds me to breathe? Can't. Who asks me to concentrate? Tell me three things you see. Couch rug, chair, three things you hear, furnace, train, dog, three things you feel, and panic's engine revs. I sit, stand, sit, pace, sit, my body, Novocaine numb. Tara guides me through the exercise over and over again. Couch, rug, chair, furnace, train, dog, orange couch, rug, chair, Train whistle, furnace humming, dog, teasing out details, orange linen couch, mid-century modern chair, until I can feel the nubby cords of shag carpet beneath my bare feet, my body's weight on the sofa, the softness of my dog Toby's coat against my palm. The grounding exercise. Think about a space, a place real or imagined, where there's a sensation where is there the sensation, sensation of being at ease, safe. Picture being there now. What is the setting? Describe textures, colors, objects, concentrate, focus on what is heard, what is smelled. How does it feel to be there? Pay attention to touch, the sensations against skin. Take a deep breath. A few moments to be there, be grounded. Now let's bring awareness back to the breath, the body. And when you're ready, open those eyes. Bearing, using two or more points as reference to determine an object's position or, direct, or direction. My domestic abuse counselor, Donna, says the decision to leave the situation is scary. It's a journey into the unknown a trust walk. She says it's like standing in front of a long dark tunnel carved through a mountain. There's a glimmer of light at the opposite end. And even though it's frightening, the only way through is forward. Break it down, step by step. No one should have to do this alone. It was you and me, babe. It was us against the world until it wasn't. Thank you. That was fantastic, Lynn. Thank you so much for thank you so much for for reading those passages. They were great. I'm just going to turn this up a little bit. Um, do you want to talk a little bit first? Um, first of all, I, I it was I, I really enjoyed reading this book. I thought it just it, the the story sort of culminated and came together out of all these different different types of of, of writing exercises or, or or processes or what have you. Can you talk a little bit? I guess about what it's like to pull a book like this together. I mean, it's got so many different pieces and so many different um, approaches to the same story that sort of circle back around. Um, I imagine it would have been fairly challenging to, to, to structure and pull together. 
Mm -hmm. One of the things that um, I did was have all the essays printed out. And then for me, it was like creating a mosaic, just what would kind of fit where in order to, to paint the picture of, of the themes that I was trying to relate and the situations that I wanted to talk about. Um, so I found that that was a very good way for me to organize those different essays. As well, my editor, who was Whitney French, um, she was really helpful in helping to organize the essays as well. So it was a collaborative effort. Mm -hmm. and, and had she ever worked on a, a project like this, uh, of this sort of diverse sort of uh, structures and, and what have you? Um, not that I'm aware of, but she has um, edited the anthology Black Writers Matter. Um, so those are assortment of different essays in an anthology that she was the editor. And that was actually how um, I came to be published, was that she became a um, acquisitions editor for Dungeon Press and then reached out to me and said, you know, do you have anything ready or close to being ready? And I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so I forwarded what I had to her as well as a book proposal. And um, yeah, it was a go from them. That's amazing. I, I can't imagine being a, a you know, a, a, a publisher or whatever and, and, and getting this, this manuscript and you just leaf through and every, every six or seven pages, it's like, oh my gosh we're, we're dealing with something completely different here <laughs> but the story is the same and 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 comes together in in this way sort of i think once you've read all the essays in in, in a way that really paints a, a complete picture which is is incredible and, and such an, an amazing task to be able to accomplish um were there certain forms that you tried out in essays that just didn't work for you or make the cut i mean you you're just you're I feel like your imagination just sort of must just run the gamut in, in, in pulling these pieces together and writing these pieces in different forms. Mm -hmm. um, pulling the, can you repeat the question for me? Jessica? Oh, just, I, I was just wondering if like, you know, there was uh, uh, other forms, other, other, you know, other right. essays or segments or whatever that, that you tried that just, it, you just couldn't make it work. I don't, I don't want to talk about failures or anything like that, but just, yeah. you know, you, you tried it and you just felt like this is not the right fit or feel for this, this manuscript. Yeah, there were uh, a number of essays that didn't make the cut into the book. And um, some of them were essays that I felt would work better elsewhere, like with literary magazines or what have, have you. Um, so, the um, form really um, helped me present which, which forms I wanted to use. Um, it was kind of organic how these essays came together. And then it was a matter of just like doing that mosaic thing and putting it together so that, you know, um, the essays could be written, read separately, but they could also be written that read as an entirety and mm -hmm. and that makes it the memoir that it is mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um aaron do you want to jump in with anything while i i'm just gonna look over at some notes here oh, of course uh so we had a question from a reader uh, who was curious about why you chose persephone's children as the title of the book and i was wondering if we could use that as a bit of a jumping off point to also talk about the genesis and seed of the project as well. When did you first envision these essays as a collected work? I think once I had a couple of essays written and I had the idea of Persephone's Children, which I think might have come first, simply because that title just really popped into my head and I went, that's, that's what I'm going for. Um, I chose the title because it resonated with me in terms of being, you know, by having to live in liminal spaces and that that was something that Persephone within the Greek mythology uh, had, to, had to do as well, living between, you know, the earth and the underworld. Um, it also reminded me of, of having to adapt to what that, what that is like to have to be, you know, um, shifting realities depending upon what 
you know, what group or what situation that you're in. Um, it also reminded me of It also reminded me of how the book was presented in terms of, I saw like the concept of Persephone's children as like, like a dandelion seed, just kind of like blown and stare. And there are all these little pieces that, that come off from it. But yet there was still the hole when, when it was a dandelion seed, if that makes any sense. So um, Persephone's children was really, um, the way to go for a title and the essays that I made use of some were started prior to but once I knew that I wanted to work on this particular project I was more focused on okay what exactly do I need to tell and how am I going to go about telling it and you have uh, several previously uh, written novels as well uh, so I know that you have a lot of experience writing fiction yourself was there a point where you determined that this was a story that you needed to tell from a purely personal uh, standpoint via nonfiction, where fiction just wouldn't work? Yeah, it was very much, I wanted it to be nonfiction. I wanted it to be me, give myself the opportunity to tell my story and hopefully connect with readers who um, may have gone through similar situations or might not have gone through and just are interested in the story as the story itself. And so can you maybe, can you talk a little bit about the reactions the book uh, has elicited from readers that you've spoken with or heard from? I'm, I'm fascinated to, to hear about that. Um, I, I, I really appreciate it when readers get in touch and let me know what their thoughts are on the book. All of it has been incredibly um, positive that, that people have said that they've been, they've been seen by reading my book and you know, statements like that just really get you in, in the heart because it's just so, um, it's just so wonderful to hear that, that people not only um, are enjoying the book as a book, but that they're also enjoying it as a way to eat, see if maybe that's how they could go about telling a story because there's so many ways a story can be told and this, you know, provides an opportunity for how, perhaps to get other people's creative juices flowing and get them writing. Yeah, and that must imbue you with, like, I mean, I, I would think sort of coming coming back to this, whether it be now or whether it be sort of, you know, at the launch or, or you know, through edits or, or what have you, it would be fairly difficult, potentially tra traumatic um, or, or triggering or, or, or what have you. Does that sort of feedback from readers imbue you with more and, and, and in conjunction with like maybe a bit more distance from when you first uh, wrote the pieces and when the, the events occurred, does that imbue you with more strength to sort of move forward? Um, it does. Like the more distance I was able to garner, the better I was able to deal with and handle, you know, the material that was being written. Um, the the structures being used were very helpful to me in order to tell the story because then it was as much an intellectual exercise in just finding how to, how, what structure is going to go well with what particular content. Um, and, and that exercise of trying to, to connect structure with, with content really gave me the, the distance that I needed to write the book because um, for a good portion of the, well, for the entire portion of the book, I was dealing with the aftermath of leaving. So I was writing while I was in the thick of it and I didn't have the temporal distance in order to write it. So there had to be other ways that I had to find in order to be able to put, you know, put on page what I did. That's great. Sorry, Erin, go ahead. Yeah, so one of the things that I, found so beautifully done and so interesting, and it was a reader question as well, was the use of homes and houses, both like literally and metaphorically throughout many of the different essays. And I was wondering if you could sort of elaborate on, on that sort of through line and if, if that was a conscious thing or if, if it kind of 
um, organically came up as you were putting these essays together? Yeah, no, it was very much a con conscious thing. Um, the thing about leaving a domestic abuse situation is that you've got to look for housing and um, I've had to move numerous times through this whole period because of, you know, situations being what situations are. Um, and home for home, the theme of home is a very important thing to, to me. Um, it's still something that I'm questioning and grappling with because I still don't feel that I'm home yet. Um, but hopefully, you know, in time that that sense of security and safety and feeling, yes, this is home and home is, you know, all those good things. Yeah, I love that passage. I, 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 I'm not gonna be able, I was trying to find it while you were re talking um, where you're, you're, I believe you're talking with your daughters and, you know, you, you're, you're feeling a little bit down about, you know, the fact that, you know, you've moved a few times or what have you. And, uh, and it was something, I'm, I'm totally paraphrasing here and I'm going to get it totally wrong. But, uh, you know, you're talking about how, you know, home is wherever we are. Home is wherever, you know, you'll, you'll be able to sort of obviously remember better than I. But uh, I, I just found that, that part to be so evocative and so, so touching and, and, you know, I, I hope I hope wherever you are now. I'm not sure where that is, but uh, you're feeling some sense of, uh, of of groundedness and 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 what have you. Mm -hmm, very much so. Yes, and and that feeling of home. I mean, when my daughters were over for that solstice, and I was, you know, in the rocking chair with the new grandbaby, and feeling so much like you know, I've, I've, I've ruined our solstice because we aren't in our home, we're, we're someplace else. And it just, I had so, so much guilt about that. But then when they say, said to me, like, no, mom, home is where you are. And it just, just like struck me to the core. And I, and I thought about it. And I went, okay, that's true. And I could embrace um, all the love that was coming my way from my kids. That's fantastic. Yeah, I was going to say um, the way that you're talking about that, it's very much like home is, a, is a, it's not necessarily like a building, it's a person, right? And, and I thought on the flip side, like you illustrated how, um, how feeling unsafe with a person can feel very much like you're not at home. Feeling unsafe with your family can feel very much like you're not at home. Um, so I thought that was like a very interesting um, juxtaposition of what home is supposed to feel like versus what it does feel like for some people. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Uh, we did have one other question sort of semi-related to this, and that was, how was this memoir received by your family and friends after they read it? Um, friends, but my writing friends, they were really good about it. Um, um, in terms of friends, like close friends or what have you, um, they were they were cool with it too. My family, um, my mother has passed away, and my father lives elsewhere, and as do my siblings. And I didn't because I believe that this was my story to tell. That I just I wrote it, and I tried to be. Um, mindful in the writing, um, but I did believe that, you know, there was a level of honesty that I had to put forth into the book. And I think that almost sort of um, ties back into what I sort of interpreted as almost like your adopted family, your writing community, um, and, and the importance of that. Um, you talk about how finding your voice is so important uh, after being silenced by, by family and by ex-partners and how taking these writing classes were so essential to that process of, of finding your voice. Can you talk a little bit about sort of that experience of taking those writing classes and workshops, how they helped you, how maybe, you know, someone coming to this book might uh, benefit or, or, or consider sort of do, doing a similar project and trying to find their own voice again? Mm -hmm. um when I started taking courses that was at McNally Robinson 
And I took classes with um, Marjorie Anderson and Dave Williamson. So that's where it really started. And the whole impetus for that was that my eldest had issued a challenge and said, you know, we have all this creativity and we're not using it. So I wanted to be a good role model to my daughters. And I picked up the pen and I started writing again. And I'm quite surprised at all that has happened just because that challenge was issued. Um, can you repeat part of what the question was? Oh, I was just sort of, you know, what, what people what people might expect, you know, like, or, or if they're maybe considering, they, they come to your book, they read it, they see the, the benefits of, of doing these, these writing classes and, and the, the oh, work right. that you did and stuff. And, and just, you know, what those experiences are like. And, and I know you still have a, a uh, it seems like you still have a close relationship with a, a lot of people who you, you know, either did the writing classes with or, or join, uh, uh, created writers groups with. Yes, very much so. They were the, they were the first people that I was able to um, form relationships with because of part part of being in an abusive relationship like I was is that it's very isolating and you're just left with yourself and this other person. Um, the classes at McNally were great. Um, the, the material I wrote there, um, I was encouraged to submit to um, contest. So I submitted one short story to Rue Magazine and it won second place in their contest. And then I submitted another story to um, Prairie Fire. And I'm thinking, who am I to send this something into a contest to Prairie Fire? Like, this is like only the second thing I've really written. And, but Dave Williamson said, no, nope, send it in. The, the, it's gonna work, it's gonna work, send it in. So I did on his encouragement um, and it happened to win second place in the contest and then won, uh, was part of the Journey Prize anthology. So uh, Dave was right. <laughs> Dave is often right. You know, he, he's a reviewer for the, for the free press books section and, uh, and, and, I, and as is Marjorie actually, occasionally, but Dave more, more so. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, he's, he's rarely wrong and he's, uh, he's always a good, a good person to bounce uh, ideas off of. I've found, at least in my own my own work with them or whatever, in terms of you know of writing or editing or just the, the literary world in general. He's a he's a worldly fellow who's seen and done so much. So anyway, mm -hmm. that's not not really a question. It's just a comment. Mm -hmm. And the, yeah, Dave is yeah. I I like Dave. Dave's one of my favorite people. Um, and I also, because I started in courses, workshops that were fiction-based, at some point I knew that I wanted to write creative nonfiction, but I didn't know how to do it, how to go about it. I remember reading Eulabis's The Pain Scale and thinking, I want to write like that, but how do you write like that? And I was fortunate to come, come across Nicole Breit and her courses on creative nonfiction, her workshops on creative nonfiction, and pieces that I wrote through those course workshops wound up placing and being published either, you know, by winning a contest or just being accepted as a regular sub submission. So that was really my foundation in, in um, writing creative nonfiction was those workshops with her. Uh Building on the theme of both the foundation and writing community in general, I know that throughout the book you have a wide variety of epigraphs from everybody from ta Coates to Joan Didion to Adrian Rich, and you've had an opportunity to work with some really innovative memoirists and essayists like Shailene Knight, Alicia Elliott, and Whitney French, of course. So I was wondering mm -hmm. if there were any uh, other books or writers other than you, Loveless, uh, books or writers who are particularly important to you in the writing of this book, and what other writers you might consider fellow travelers in the innovative mm -hmm. work that you're doing? Yeah, I would say uh, Alyssa Washuda from the United States was very key to my writing, as was Chelsea Clammer, who was also from the United States. 
Brandon Billings Noble, who is also from the, from the US. Um, Chelsea Bilondello. Um, yeah, there, there'd be more people I could probably run a list off of, but um, those are some key people I think of just at the start. Fantastic. Erin, uh, is there anything that's come in as of late? Or? Yes, we have a question in the chat that is semi-related to something we we're talking about before. Um, so this uh, person asks, writing these essays must have been very risky, like in terms of the traumatic memories and maybe even pushback from those you write about. Um, what was this experience like for you? Um, I wasn't concerned with pushback because I had masked people's names and even with my daughters we, I use pseudonyms um I had to ask them you know what do you want your names to be in the book and they said oh mom we don't care you just pick whatever <laughs> so that's that's what I did um there there hasn't my my aunt has been really supportive of this book she's really very proud of me which makes me feel really good because she's a writer herself. So that's, that's quite wonderful. And um, yeah, it's taking a risk, but it's taking the risk in order to be honest with the story and about history and what happened to me and how I, how I started to find my way out of it, you know, to, to be out of that particular relationship. There was, sorry, one other reader question that is related to that, um, specifically about the final chapter and as you're moving out of the house and kind of taking some things and letting go of other things in a very literal way, but letting go of things in a more figurative way as well. Mm -hmm. um, our reader wanted to know, um, it's like a shedding period, fully leading into her becoming who she was and who she's truly meant to be. Is that your intention with that chapter and sort of what was your your thought with that essay. Yeah. yeah letting, um, letting go of certain possessions. Yes. I believe this was sort of the theme of that. Yeah, sorry, I was paraphrasing. It's quite a lot. No, 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 so was, <laughs> so was I. <laughs> yeah, no, there, um, that essay really was about letting go and shedding, not only shedding the trauma of some personal history, shedding, um, you know, perceptions that I had been taught, um, shedding the rules that I lived with with this person for so long, um, where I was under that rule of you don't tell. And that led to me being completely isolated because how do you form relationships with people when you can't be honest with them in terms of your own personal history? Um, so I think that in terms of, you know, writing about the different traumas is that using, it was very much making use, making use of those structures and forms in order to help guide me because to intellectualize it helped to balance off the emotional weight. So, yeah. You, um, did you find that um, like you come at, at these sometimes same or just similar or, or nearby chronologically um, situations or, or scenarios or whatever through this, this variety of different lenses in the form of the, the, the different or in the different forms that the pieces take? Did you find sort of in doing that you were able to um, sort of circle back around to particular events in your life and see them, write about them in different ways than maybe you did in the previous passage, or maybe you, you know, you're working through a certain form and you remember something from a particular instance that that maybe you hadn't in in another another approach at that same same phenomenon. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Um, so it was very much um, looking at the different essays and seeing just how they connected and being aware that there was some stuff that I just couldn't put in. Um, so 
that, yeah, it was, um, it was an exercise to be sure. Karen, uh, John, anyone, anyone? Uh, I'm sort of like, I, I had another question, but I can't. Well, on that same, on that same note, sort of where do you know where to draw that line? You said you, there, you knew that you didn't want to include certain things. So like, is that, would you have a line that's in the sand? I won't write about this. I won't do that. Is that sort of how you decide? Yeah. 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 There were things, but I just, yeah, went there not to be put on the table. And you've spoken at length about the importance of uh, kind of embracing hybridity as a way into writing about social justice. And I was wondering if you could just speak a little bit uh, as to how the various forms that it takes, uh, that your work takes, encourages people to engage with the ideas of social justice as represented in your text. Mm -hmm. I think it provides an opportunity just through the reading to connect with issues around social justice. Um, especially when it comes to race and where it comes to domestic abuse, the things that one needs to um, find to navigate those particular situations. Um, I think that writing this memoir in the way that it's written would encourage people and hopefully people of color, you know, my BIPOC communities to realize that there's so many ways they can tell stories and that stories don't have to be linear narratives, that they can be mosaics, they, they can be hybrid, they can be many different things. Um, so that's, yeah, that's kind of what I would have to say on on that particular note. Someone in the chat just asked, is that the orange couch you bought in the book and moved with you so many times? <laughs> actually, actually, no, I gave that orange couch to my daughter. This is a different one. I, I like the color orange. <laughs> It was a bit. That was a bit of an ice break, uh, tension tension breaker there. I was like, I, I was trying to formulate a question. I was looking at these notes, and then, and that was a perfect sort of uh, diffusion of tension. I guess. So. <laughs> I have kind of a question going back to like where we were for, where we started with the actual um, sort of technical aspect of the book. I'm I have a music background. I always love to listen to albums from first song to last song because I love to see how musicians have slotted out and chosen the sequencing for their album. And I felt that this um, book with the essay, the alphabet essay that started the thing was so, so strong. And I just loved it so much. So I wanted to ask you a little bit more about how you sequenced these essays, what that process was like and how you decided where to start and where to slot things in. Um, I knew that I wanted that first essay, Blood Ties a Primer, that that would be the one to ground and act as the springboard for what was to come. Um, it helped, it talked about, you know, um, intergenerational traumas and personal histories, talked about race, racism in Canada, um, topics that were very important to me to discuss. And like I said, in terms of organizing the essays, it was very much um, laying things out and then just looking at the themes and then content and how, how was the best way to put together the story. And like I say, Whitney French, my editor also played a huge role in that. Cause yeah, she gave, she gave a mix to some of those essays and <laughs> I went, I'm so glad she did. <laughs> a good editor will do that. <laughs> yes, 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 they will. I had a what might potentially be a bit of an odd question, but just I really love the chapter that you actually wrote in the form of a grimoire as well, and was wondering on your thoughts, um, because I know a lot of the book is very grounded, but I was wondering about your thoughts of writing as conjuration or evocation or even as kind of a form of cleansing, and also what your own writing process and ritual is, mm -hmm. if there is a ritual involved. <laughs> Especially given the, you know, the current situation, two years plus of sort of being, you know, 
hold up or whatever. I mean, I always like to see sort of how writers are faring during this crazy present time that we're in too, so. Mm -hmm. I find that what helps for me is that um, I also have editing work to do with the fiddlehead. So I get to wear different hats. I can, I'm wearing the, you know, write my writer's hat, wearing my editor's hat. Um, and between the two, they kind of help guide me in terms of writing. I have, I've had a bit of a dry spell simply because I think I've got a little bit of that pandemic fatigue, but I've, I'm, I looked at some rough drafts because I'm working on a short story collection and um, went, okay, the, the basics are there. Now you've got to like fill in your details and what have you. Um, so it's, so it's um, working on just pulling those different things together. Um, yeah, and, and, and I mean, I think so many of us have sort of experienced, uh, you know, pandemic fatigue and, and, and what have you. And, you know, I, I, I'm always sort of, yeah, I'm always sort of interested in, in to, to hear from writers about that because, you know, so much of it is a solitary exercise to begin with, but, you know, when we're all sort of solitary and, and, you know, the, our, our norms are sort of taken away. It really does sort of, sort of change things, I think for, for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, so how, you know, are, are you a fair ways into this short story collection? I seem to, I, I was reading some interviews with you earlier uh, in the last couple of days. And I remember, I do seem to recall you mentioning this, this collection before. So it seems like it must be sort of pretty well underway. Yeah, I'm 40,000 words in. And I know the stories that I need to, it's just a matter of writing them. Um, but yeah, I'm hoping there'll be 13 in the collection just because to go with the title, The Mausoleum of Lost Souls. So yeah. It's a I'm great title. I, you, you come up with fantastic titles, uh, that, that's Thank for you. sure. Um, <laughs> and, and fantastic content, obviously. But uh, um, uh, what was it like sort of transitioning from writing these essays and, and editing them and putting them into the world to sort of moving back into the world of fiction? Um, it, it gives me a nice break, you know, because then I get to explore other worlds that, that aren't the reality that I'm living. Yeah, other um, people's problems. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, it, so I find that it's, um, it's kind of, it lightens the heaviness of just, you know, being someone that's healing from this particular kind of situation. Um, it's another opportunity to play, but play in a different way with words. And I, I really enjoy short stories. So that's what I thought I would work on next. Thanks. Um, do you have any, do you have any sort of favorite short story writers that you sort of turn to on a regular basis uh, in, in terms of what you like to read and stuff or, or, or influences or? Um, Amy Hempel, George Saunders. I love George Saunders. I would like, I would like to have a dinner party and have George Saunders come in the tent. Um, if that ever happens, please do let me know. <laughs> I'll let All you of know. Us. Yeah. <laughs> You'll be on the guest list for sure. Um, uh, Brandon Billing Snowball, her books are excellent. Um, she's actually edited a lyric anthology called A Harp in the Stars. So it's a collection of essays that are not only representative of the different forms of lyric essay, but also have craft essays as well. So it's a really very uh, innovative and well-rounded book and it's something that um yeah i have to pick up a few copies to mail out to people so i'll be seeing you i'll be seeing you john um i'm always so curious about like the the writing um you know books about the craft of writing and, and how to go about writing like uh you know when i was in my undergrad degree doing creative writing stuff uh writing on the bones by natalie goldberg was like a, was a big one and uh is that is that something that you find uh, are those the kind of books you find 
helpful in sort of, you know, whether it's sort of lighting up, lighting a fire under you or just sort of like sparking an idea? Mm -hmm. I very much enjoy reading craft books. I find that they, you know, they give you the opportunity to think about writing and the act of thinking about writing, I think, isn't as integral as the writing itself. Just to have that time to reflect and to contemplate on, you know, um, what might what might resonate with me as a writer and what I might not feel is quite as applicable to myself. So we do have one uh, final question from the chat, which is kind of apt as we were winding up. Mm -hmm. um, someone said, asked, how do you know as a writer when a work is done and does it need any more reworking on your part? Can someone tell you you're done and you would believe it or is it more of a personal epiphany? Um, when I write, I tend to revise a lot. Like the essay Blood Ties probably went through 40 revisions oh. because, because I go into the piece and back into the piece and back into the piece. And even on a sentence level, it's got to be just so. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot the question. Oh, just um, if, if your brain. editor, if your editor was to say this is done, like, would you believe them, or does it have to be your own voice telling you that it's done? Um, I I would sort of believe the editor. <laughs> I think, I think for myself, when I um, complete an essay after many revisions, it's like where I get to the point where I think if I go back in, I'm going to start ruining it. That's when I know it's done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That fine line. I've been there in terms of, well, not in terms of book length things, but in terms of article length things for the, for the paper, but I did, uh, I know that uh, my editor, who was Aaron for this uh, intents and pro for all intents and purposes, did send me a message saying that uh, we only had a few minutes left. So um, uh, before I forget, I want I just wanted to thank you so much, Rowan, for for well, I wouldn't have forgotten, but uh, uh, just thank you so much for for joining our book club and for Persephone's Children, which uh, yeah, it was just a a really fascinating book and just so well written and 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 you know just you your responses and, and your your insight into the the book has been, just been so thoughtful and uh yeah I, we really appreciate it i mean i'm only speaking on my own behalf but i'm pretty mm -hmm. sure that i'm speaking on everyone's behalf when i say we really appreciate you coming and talking about the book and uh and sharing your thoughts on it thank you so very much i really enjoyed being here with all of you and um feel a lot of gratitude so thank you guys as well we got some really lovely comments from people that weren't questions. So I'll forward those along to you so <laughs> you can get their feedback. Um, oh, after. Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, and just before we go, we're going to talk a little bit about next month's book, You Don't Have to Die in the End by Anita Dare, also a local author. I think this is our first YA, like young adult fiction that we've done. So I'm kind of excited to dive into that. Um, and then next month, Ben's uh, on the bench. <laughs> we're getting, we're getting uh, Jill Wilson uh, to come in and host. Uh, actually, for the next few months, we're going to have different free press staffers kind of cycle through the host seat so that you'll get to know a bunch of Ben and my colleagues. Um, they're all familiar names from the paper. So if you're a regular reader, you will recognize them. Jill is a copy editor, arts reporter, kind of, and does uh, an, an arts newsletter called Applause. There will be much more information about that in your inbox tomorrow morning. Um, otherwise, no one else has anything to add. That's, that's it for tonight. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you so much, Rowan and Ben and John, and we will see you all again next month. Bye.